Anyway, I want to welcome everybody to uh, this morning's co committee meeting. It's July 15th. I'm joined today by Council President Eric Garcetti. It would appear, Mr. City Attorney, that on this day we will not have a quorum, so all of uh, today's actions will be deemed to communicate from the chair. Uh, we do have several items that I believe we can move quickly. And... Uh, Ms. Barclay, I think we can get things started. I'm going to ask you to read uh, item one. Meg Barclay, CLA. Item one is a report from the Community Redevelopment Agency and the Chief Legislative Analyst relative to a loan agreement with Normandy Terrace Partners LP for the Normandy Terrace Affordable Housing Project. On uh, item one, as a communique from the chair, we'll adopt the CLA report. Item two. Item two is a report from the CRA and the City Administrative Officer and a resolution relative to the acquisition of property located at 1901 Santee Street, 206 East Washington and 1918 South Los Angeles Street in the Council District 9 corridor south of the Santa Monica Freeway Redevelopment Project area. Okay, item two will adopt the CAO report. Item three. Item three is a report from the CRA and the CAO relative to amending an existing exclusive negotiation agreement with Mercy Housing California to extend the term of performance and to provide additional pre-development funds to be used in the redevelopment of two southern blocks of Washington Boulevard. Okay. Uh, item three will adopt this uh, CAO report, bringing us to item four. Item four reports from the CRA and the CLA relative to amending the business attraction and retention program for portions of Council District 3. Okay, adopt the CLA report on that item. Item five, we will continue for one week. That brings us to item six. Item six reports from the CRA and the CAO relative to a cooperation agreement with the Department of Recreation and Parks to provide $5 million in CRA funds for construction services and receive $5 million for technical services to coordinate public park improvements. Okay, on item six, we'll adopt the CAO report. Ms. Barclay, which uh, item will we have uh, Judge Sotomayor? Uh, when, aren't we scheduled to question her today? I believe that's next week, sir. Item seven. <laughs> item seven. <laughs> item seven is a report from the Los Angeles Housing Department relative to re releasing requests for qualifications for bond underwriters, financial advisors, trustees, auditors, accountants, and master services and extending the term of the existing qualified LAHD Housing Finance Team participants until December 31st, 2009. Okay, then we will, uh, is that adopt the uh, Housing Department's report? Yes, sir. Oh, and that's what we'll do on that item. Uh, I, let's um, do item eight. Item made is a report from the Community Development Department relative to information regarding the loan portfolio and loan programs of its Economic Development Division. We also recommend that this report be amended to request a report from the CAO relative to the loan portfolio. Okay, then on, on, on that item, we will adopt the CDD report and request the CAO report back in 30 days. That brings us to, well, item 10 that... Uh, we will continue for one week, and item 11, I guess we're just not going to hear today. So, Mr. City Attorney, all of those items will be deemed approved as a communique from the chair. Uh, we have, I think, one public comment card at this time. Anyway, you know every week I have a story. <laughs> So, after the All-Star Game, there's literally nothing on television. <laughs> nothing. My son has been playing around with my TiVoing things without my permission. <laughs> so he has a series called Scare Tactics, which is hilarious, and something called The World's Dumbest Criminals. <laughs> there was a group of guys in Chicago that successfully robbed a bank. They got $81,000. No leads, 
on the case. These guys were going to be off scot-free. They have a radio station there called True Confessions. One of the guys called the radio station, confessed to the crime. <laughs> An FBI agent was listening to the program. He was then arrested. The moral of the story, the guy's name is D. If you ever commit a crime in Chicago, make sure the person that you work with, that his name is not D. He definitely qualifies for one of the dumbest criminals ever. Also a guy broke into a 7-Eleven. He came through the roof, stole four porno magazines. That's all. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Tries to get out of the door. They show him banging on the door, throwing things on the door. All he had to do was turn the lock and go out. The police catch him as he's trying to go back up through the roof with four <laughs> magazines. So anyway, I just want to say if there's nothing on television and you want to see stupidity at its best, and you don't want to watch our council, that maybe you should watch World's Dumbest Criminals. Mr. Tennant. Wow. wow. I didn't prepare the speech today, so it's going to be short. And anyway, we should congratulate Mr. Tennant. In a, is it a couple of days, he's going to go to Alaska for a few weeks. So you have a good time. And I do anticipate that you will be bringing back fish. Well, I will promote the goodwill of the city of Los Angeles. And of course, Herb and Eric there, I will do that. Good to uh, see you. I wanted to stop by and let you know I'm going up there. But I also wanted, last week, I made reference to something that went like this. Da 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 do, doodly doodly do, cock a doodle do. And it had to do with an issue that I spoke at public comment. And I'll be darned, people call me up the next day on KNX 1070 News. They're reciting that. It was riveting. It was riveting. You never know when you think people don't listen at public comment. They do. Because there it was. I also wanted to, I'm working on something now, the educational nature, excursions on the oceans for kids, with 10 points in there that it's the best deal there is, and they're going to get to see all these kinds of things there. Wonderful. And uh, I did want to say on my trip up there, I'm going up there for business also, uh, something, uh, some people are going to have some music in the X Games. And that's another reason. Of course, I'll go fishing, but I'll always, uh, I just wanted you guys know that I would always support you, Herb Wesson, and Eric Garcetti in the city and a lot of the good things that they do. And uh, I know I'm going to have a good time there. And uh, I just wanted to say, hold on to the fort while I'm gone. You know, I always support you. But that's uh, that's about it. So it was short. Okay, Chuck. Well, we, you know, I guess I can say seriously, you will be missed. You are a classy guy. And I look forward to seeing you on committee meeting. This, this program, when it's ready, uh, be a great thing where the city can help kids and the city can make money from it. Okay. So they don't have to spend anything, and it will help a lot of kids. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks, Chuck. I also neglected to say that they had a guy in England that <laughs> robbed a store, tried to rob a store with a bow and arrow. <laughs> He accidentally shoots the arrow and doesn't hit the guy. The guy chases him, and then about nine women, part of his family, come from the back, and they chase the guy. <laughs> One guy robs a store, and he sits up and he tells the guy, you know, give him the money. And he's, the guy is giving him the money, and he puts his gun down to collect the money. The guy takes his gun, he runs out, then he comes back a half hour later, beats the guy up to take the gun back. This time he left a fingerprint guy caught. <laughs> anyway, okay, now, that brings us to item nine. Miss Barclay, you want to read item nine? Yes, sir. Item nine is a city re attorney report and ordinance relative to establishing a fee for appealing a determination regarding the status of a unit in a residential hotel as residential or transient. 
Okay. Now, it's, it's my understanding that initially on this issue, we had 16 cards. Uh, there has been some discussion amongst the group selecting two individuals to be more of a spokesperson for them. So what I think I would like, I want to try to accommodate uh, date you. We generally don't cede one's time, but since this is, we don't do that in council, but since this is a committee hearing, uh, I think I have a little latitude and I'm willing to look at a way to grant that request. So what I'm thinking is I have uh, Ray Patel and Raj Patel and maybe we give them, what, six minutes each? Does, does that, uh, that, that, that those are not the people that you want? It would be Ray Patel, Mark Carriott, and then Mark Patel will speak uh, those two minutes allocated. Oh, then, then that is, as they say, my bad. So we'll do this. <laughs> you have Mark Basaria, is that one? And Ray Patel, and we still have Raj Patel, right? Okay, so why don't we, do no? Well, he's part of the group, Raj. It's just uh, the first two would, would speak. So why don't we bring up Mark and Ray. How did I get Raj? He's that, in there too. There's a, there's a third card. So are we going to let Raj speak? No, sir. We're not. Okay. So you two have six minutes each. We start with... Uh, Raj will speak. Oh, he wants to speak. Too. Yeah, just two minutes. Okay. So what we'll, we'll get... Raj, come on up. Is there a seat there? Yeah. Okay. I have a, a good friend of mine named Mike Patel. I don't know if you know Mike. <laughs> no. Yeah, and Joe Patel. But no, Mike has been a friend of mine since 1992 when I was uh, working for uh, Supervisor Burke, and he used to visit me when I was in Sacramento. But anyway, welcome. Thank you. Mark, you're first. Ray, right. I'd like to thank the committee for taking the time to hear my comments. My name is Mark Bacari. I represent the Royal Palace Westwood Hotel. It's a 36-room limited service hotel in Westwood Village, two blocks from UCLA. Um, our hotel was declared a residential hotel. Um, we were told, uh, we received a letter. Um, it was postmarked three weeks after the date of the letter. So we basically were going to have three days to respond to the letter. I sent a, a letter immediately, a uh, fax, asking for more time. Um, I subsequently was told that I, somebody called me and told me I had seven days, that they were giving me a seven-day extension. They, are asking, they asked me in October of 08 to provide them with two years' worth of registration cards from 2005 and 2006. For our 36 room hotel, that equated to 20,000 registration cards and 2,500 housekeeping reports. And they wanted this. This was absolutely mandatory that I provide this. Three prior occasions, this has been going on for a long time with them, Three prior occasions, I provided them with occupancy tax returns. All of those occupancy tax returns showed uh, not one month had more than 10% of the income uh, exempt. So 90% or more was taxable income. Clearly a, tr a transient hotel, not a residential hotel. Uh, I had a meeting with Mercedes Marquez on January 4th. I expressed that nobody responded to me. She said I would get a response in writing. That, that response came March 13th. So, and that was with follow-up emails asking what the status of. And the March 13th was, since I didn't file for appeal in February, the deadline in February, I have no appeals process uh, uh, left, and, and I have been declared a residential. Um, the way this ordinance, the way it's being enforced, is, is not per, is not proper uh, uh, to provide. Re and registration cards wouldn't have, uh, have shown anything to them. And, and it's just not fair what they did to us. Um, with, with regards, they, they're asking uh, this committee now to approve a $988 fee. This is very key. They put in there $188 for a three-hour site visit. They specifically have told everybody, including the appeals that they've already done, that they will not do a site inspection, that they're too busy. So I don't see how this committee can go and approve that $988 fee if, if, um, if they're not going to do the site inspection. And they knowingly signed this uh, 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 measure knowing that they've told everybody that they will not do a site inspection because they're too busy. Um, thank you for thank you for your time. Uh, Chairman Wilson, if I can have Raj Patel speaking out, I'll, I'll... Oh, you want to be the closer? Yes, I'll be the oh, closer. Just take less than a minute. Uh, no, just take first, 
Uh, thanks for letting us speak today. That's very powerful. I have a small business. I'm a small business owner and operator like these fellows here. I have only one small business in the city of Los Angeles. I have been doing business for several years. Never felt like this before. I have small business friends in Orange County, San Bernardino County, and when I told them about this residential hotel ordinance, their view was this is an outrage. And surprisingly, one of them said that never knew or expected of this kind of things will happen in the United States of America and in Los Angeles City, which is known for a business-friendly city. I've been always proud to do business in the city of L.A. since last year, 2008, when the city of housing department has been very unfriendly, unresponsive, and uninformative, and made us feel very negative about investing in L.A. Be fine. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, Council Member Chairman uh, Wesson and Council Member Garcetti, good morning. I'm uh, Ray Patel, I'm President of the Northeast Los Angeles Hotel Owners Association. Uh, but some of our, our, our members of our association are here also. Uh, the ordinance uh, uh, 180175, um, which uh, sets certain standards for uh, addressing hotels in Los Angeles that are actually residential hotels. That ordinance has been used by the LHC staff uh, to actually apply to tourist hotels also. And mainly they've been targeting the smaller Ma and Pa hotels throughout Los Angeles that still cater to tourism. And the criteria set up in the ordinance give them full authority to make a determination without any evidence ahead of time to say, you're a residential hotel, now go ahead and pay the sequence of fees to appeal our decision. And what we're finding throughout Los Angeles, many of our member properties uh, that are tourist hotels, they may have some extended stay guests. These guests check out, people come in and stay again. And throughout Los Angeles, you're going to have these smaller hotels that cater to construction workers or office workers that come to Los Angeles, stay one month, two months, six months, three months, maybe up to a year, and they check out, and then that room is rented for daily rental. We did a survey throughout Los Angeles, and the most underserved area of Los Angeles the daily accumulated 31-day rent is $1,100. That hotel clearly would not benefit this city as a residential hotel if it was converted. And I'm not talking about establishments that are 80%, 90%, almost 100% residential hotels, mainly what you see in the downtown Los Angeles area. We respect what the ordinance is looking to preserve, but it seems to have overshot throughout Los Angeles outside of downtown, and the staff at LHD is left to make those decisions. Now, in the case of Mark Carrier, the situation is very common throughout Los Angeles to the hotels in that list that you got for 333 properties. What they did was they sent out a survey uh, somewhere around 2004, 2005, a similar survey that you would get as an apartment owner, a systematic code enforcement program. And they would ask these hotel owners on the form, do you have anybody staying over 31 days? And Many of these properties that didn't have anybody staying over 31 days would fill the form out and say, I don't have anybody. Shortly after that, a staff person from the Los Angeles Housing Department would show up and say, hello, may I look at your hotel, walk through the rooms, leaving it up to the property owners. Often they would say, sure, go ahead, you know, it's after checkout time. And they would walk through the properties. They would see none of the rooms are long-term tenants, so to speak. And shortly after that, they would get a bill. The bill would come in and say, you have to pay the systematic code enforcement program fees. The property owner would pick up the phone, call the phone number on the bill, as I've done also, and many of our members, the phone just rings. Nobody picks up. And if somebody uh, did pick up, it would be an answering machine. And it would say, we're all busy, leave a message. You would not get a call back. Many of our property members have called 20 times. I have called 20 times. Then you would get a letter from the city attorney's office. The two city attorneys that worked on the task force for this ordinance, they would sign that letter. I called one of them up on behalf of some of the property owners. I said, what is the reason for this bill? We haven't had an opportunity to get somebody on the other line to discuss the bill because it's stating that we are a residential hotel. The answer from the city attorney's office was that you really need to talk to the housing department. And we would explain there's no answer on the other line. And if you did get somebody eventually at the housing department, they would defer to the billing department saying that's really something you need to go to the billing department for. If you contacted the billing department, eventually someone would pick up the phone, the same response, but the opposite. You really need to talk to LAHD. This was not uncommon in the past few years. 
When a property received a letter from the uh, city attorney's office stating that you better pay your bill, otherwise we're going to put a lien on your property, and the property owner, small business owner who cannot afford uh, perhaps an attorney to really push, push this issue through, would end up just saying, you know, let me just pay it. It'll go away. Several years later, Ordinance 180175 was amended to state that 333 properties in Los Angeles were sent a survey and 87% did not ask for exemption. That is not true. I'm a prime example of that. Mr. Bacari is a prime example of that. Many people here that are behind me are prime examples of that. And the association represents many property owners that are not here today because they are Ma and Pa innkeepers in the city of Los Angeles. They're actually at the front desk. They are their own staff. We're not able to come here today, so we're representing those people. What we're asking this, this committee is to reevaluate the Los Angeles Housing Department's uh, procedures and how they're applying this ordinance. Respectively, this ordinance should be used to preserve existing residential hotels. When we inquired with building and safety uh, as far as why this, this list was given to LHD and why certain hotels were left off, the, uh, what we found was many of the older hotels or hotels built in the 30s or earlier or even in the 50s were given a identification of the building permit as hotel comma apartment. And even apartments were given that designation. Newer hotels as time went on were not given that designation. It seems from our research they weren't on that list. So there needs to be a little bit better scrutiny on that list that LHD received from Building and Safety as far as the hotels, because they're not all residential hotels. My property is the Welcome Inn in Eagle Rock at 1840 West Colorado. It's a nice 24-unit New Orleans-style motel. It caters to tourists and locals in the area and the community homeowners. Clearly not a residential property. We haven't had any long-term tenants there. And properties like that, no. uh, properties such as the Welcome Inn, didn't receive a notice that basically said, your residential hotel, send us three years of registration card copies, which could number in the 30,000s. So you're sitting there Xerox copying each registration card of a guest. And then you send it to LHD. Properties like mine were given a notice to send in one-year registration cards. And you had seven days or ten days to do it. Um, Sending in registration cards does not clearly allow an LAHD employee to evaluate if it's that establishment is a residential property. You have to look at the rates. You have to look at the address on the registration card. And many of the properties that have lost to hearings that have paid the $988 to get to the hearing status that have lost don't have residents more than maybe 10% uh, of their establishment. But since the ordinance was written as such, and this is interesting, the Property owner must prove preponderance of evidence that they're not a residential hotel. Normally, what we look at is if you're a residential hotel, then you evaluate the establishment itself. Do an on-site visit and properly document. We welcome that. And if you need to see a registration card to determine if it's a residential hotel for whatever system is set up, you need to come on site. And reason for that, just like the finance department does audits for the TOT for hotels, by the way, the lodging industry of Los Angeles is the second largest contributor to the general fund. They will come on site and review the registration cards because of privacy reasons. The hotel owner's privacy plus the guests. We have not notified the hotel guests that this LHD wants to review your, you know, your stay at this hotel. Because when we asked the Los Angeles Housing Department Will the privacy of the guests be, be preserved and the financial information of the hotel owners? The answer was no, we cannot guarantee the privacy because it's public information afterwards. Okay, uh, Mr. Patel, I think what I want to appreciate you guys, all of you, taking the time to come today. But um, I'm going to ask you to take a seat and then we're going to ask the, the housing department staff to come up. Thank you. No, thank you guys. Please, uh, housing. Now I'm going to ask you <coughs> to kind of walk me through this process. But before I ask that question, please tell me about this telephone number that rings and rings. The telephone number is that uh, they're making reference. I have to uh, identify yourself. I'm Roya Babazade, Los Angeles Housing Department. We do have a uh, billing hotline. 10 phone, uh, phones and uh, 10 uh, operators from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. 
answering more than 5,000 calls a year. So all the billing questions are answered that way. Besides that, we also have a hotline for the housing department that if that line is busy, they can call that hotline and be transferred to a billing staff to assist them. But we do also have three staff, senior staff, answering residential hotel calls every day at any time from 8 to 5 p.m. So we have, there is a hotline number with 10 operators, and they on average get about 5,000 calls daily. A year. A year? A year. So they get 5,000 calls for the entire year. So we have 10 operators, and then you said there's a backup phone number they can call as well? The department also has a hotline, another hotline that if any other calls, any housing-related calls can be referred to that hotline. If they call billing hotline and for any reason it's a peak time, for example, there is a waiting, they call that hotline. And all the hotlines or phone numbers are published on our bills, so they are aware of all the phone numbers that they can call. So if we called the hotline number right now, somebody would pick up? I'm not going to ask to do that. I have to emphasize that we do issue 250,000 bills a year, and there are peak times when we send, for example, annual bill, which is 130,000 bills at one time. So there is a peak time, and at that time we receive many calls, and there might be a waiting period, and we are assisting them in any other ways by adding additional staff at that time. See, the only thing that, and I get on the people that work with me about, is that probably one of the most frustrating things in the world is to try to get through to receive any kind of government assistance. So one of my pet peeves, other than people who drive slow in front of me when I'm in a hurry, are not returning phone calls or phones that ring and ring and ring. So that's something that drives me crazy. So I'm sensitive to what some of the hotel, motel owners have stated. But I want to be fair to the housing department, and I'll say this in front of our guests that are here. It's a very tough job that they do. I'm very fortunate to chair the committee that oversees this department, because they work very well. And generally, when I make a suggestion or I need some information, you guys quickly respond. So that's not to say that there could be a flaw somewhere. If I may, Councilman. Yes. Roberto Aldopi from the Housing Department. Prior to me coming to the City of Los Angeles while I was in private practice, I, too, experienced the callback or the answering type of problem that you experienced. I made a special effort as Assistant General Manager for the Bureau that the residential hotel unit resides in to ensure customer service is our number one priority, starting from overhauling the hotline and with the negonomic studies and giving them all the equipment they need to make their job easier. But we stand by our record in terms of customer service, in terms of how we answer and how efficiently we answer our phone calls. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you to quickly run, you know, run me through how we make these determinations and what have you. As I ponder what I should suggest that we do, but how does this explain to me quickly, how does this work, and explain to me their gripe? Okay. I'm going to refer that to Ms. Babazadeh. She is actually the director, and she supervises this residential hotel unit, which we, after the ordinance was enacted, as you well know, this ordinance had experienced many public hearings, and we went to many amendments in regards to this final enactment. As a result, we had to develop a specialized unit that was dealing specifically with the status and determination of these residential units, hotels that were on this list. 
And as a result of that, I specifically put the director involved in it because we thought it was an important issue for the city of Los Angeles to make sure that these status determinations were correct and accurate. And so I'm going to ask Ms. Babazadeh, who directs it, to quickly give you a flow chart with, uh, idea of what happens. Well, welcome again, because I, I, I don't think I've seen you before. So this is... I was here when you asked me about uh, if uh, Lakers is going to win. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saved the face uh, predicting correctly. Okay. I, now I remember. <laughs> See, it's the important things in life. Right. Well, uh, I've noticed that one of the complaints was that uh, they don't get the chance to uh, provide documentation before being hit by application fees. For many of these properties that we did uh, not have concrete documentation, we did send them a letter requesting uh, to provide us with documentation that identified the status of the rooms on these hotels so we can make our determination. In that letter, they get 20 days to provide the documentation to us, and we offer them that they can have 15 uh, days extension if uh, it, um, the documentation volume is extended. And this is to give you the documentation that would, uh, what, exempt them from this? To make a determination if they are a residential hotel uh, or okay. not. Uh, and uh, for that, this is prior to our determination. So we do have that option before getting uh, our determination, before getting uh, application fees to provide us with that documentation. And uh, most of these hotels, they did provide documentation. We reviewed them. And if based on that initial review, uh, they submitted enough documentation, which uh, we asked for a variety of different things to be able to get the whole picture. We asked for rent registration cards, so we will see who was there for how long, what was the rate, and what was the address, so we can identify uh, some information through registration card. We asked for logs to see uh, the total revenue and also uh, make comparison with the information on the registration card. We also asked for uh, transient occupancy tax report that they report their uh, revenue to Office of Finance. In that report, they identified how much money they make uh, and how much of it is from residential use um, for the tenants that are staying there for more than 30 days. Uh, so with the whole picture, we can look at uh, all these three at minimum documentation and look at it and see if majority of people who occupied uh, the, that uh, motel or hotel in October 11, 2005, if they, uh, that was their primary residence or not. If by providing that documentation, they can uh, substantiate their claim that this uh, property is run as a transient motel. We don't send the initial dissemination. We just send a letter that we identify you are not a residential hotel. So uh, they're not going to be subject to any application. Some of these uh, property owners uh, presenting today, they did not submit documentation. And we went through extensive uh, review. Uh, three of them had concerns about the confidentiality of um, documentation. And we took that very seriously. We did have meetings internally and uh, with cooperation with uh, city attorney, we developed a procedure that we can uh, give them option. Instead of providing those documentation to us, they can prepare worksheets and put the information that is pri private, for example, name of the tenants. And uh, if there is a driver license, they can assign a code to the uh, person living there. And by that way, everything else that is private information is going to be masked. And then they could provide that worksheet to us for our review. For financial documentation also, instead of asking for uh, TOTR, is that you can provide us with percentage of the revenue you make uh, based on uh, residential. So uh, this uh, system that was developed um, with city attorney, we offer to these three and any other people that may have uh, concerns of confidentiality. Uh, they didn't take advantage of that. They did, still did not uh, submit documentation to us. The concern about going there in their uh, place of work to do the review is uh, this is a type of work that is extensive. As I mentioned, there are many, many documentation 
sometimes foxes. And for that, it takes absolute 90 days for my analysts to go through every one of these cards, analyze the information on the card. So having my analysts going there for 90 days is an interruption for their work and an interruption for our work, because they need supervision and question and answers all the time. It was not doable. That's why we asked them to submit the documentation, and we accommodated their concern about confidentiality. They also had another concern about communication and language barrier, that they provided with the option of translators. We do have translation system in place that if they need it, they can use that. We believe that they addressed all the issues that they brought up with us. So at the beginning, when they submit that documentation, we review it. We make a determination. If it's not a residential hotel, they are out of our list. And if, based on that original review, we identify that this is a residential hotel, we send a determination letter. Again, they get the chance to appeal that determination. That's the second chance. And on that point, of course, there is application fee, because we go through another process. And it's very extensive. When they appeal, we send them documentation we used within 15 days. What we used... So we charge them the second time. Yes. There's a fee. Okay. This is the application that... Gotcha. No, I get that. ...they appeal our determination. I get that. At that time, we also send them a letter recognizing that we received their appeal, and we provide them with a copy of any documentation we used to make our determination. So they are aware of what we used, whether it is their billing status, if they paid, registered those units as residential with us in 2005, or it was their registration card that they provided. We make copies of what we used, and we provide them at that time. They get the chance to provide us with any additional documentation. We review that. And after the analyst reviews it, we review it in a committee of the housing managers, review the decision. And another determination is done. We inform the owners about that determination, whether we accept their appeal or reject their appeal. At that time, they get to appeal that determination again, take it to the public hearing. The department of hearing officer is going to provide them with the chance to submit any other documentation or justification or reasoning they may have to object to our determination. So after that review is done, and general managers, hearing officer make the determination, that's the final determination. So that goes through a variety of reviews and many opportunities provided to these owners to provide documentation. Okay. Ray Patel could come up. Ray, I see that you are the president of the Northeast Los Angeles Hotels Owners Association. Yes, Chairman. And how many hotels are a member of the association? We represent 400 hotels. We've separated the city by council districts, and we have board members that represent that area in the prospective council district and interact with those hotels. So out of that 400 or whatever it was, how many are actually, are they actually in the city of Los Angeles? They're all in the city of Los Angeles. There's 700 hotels in Los Angeles. We represent 400 of those. Of that, what's the number that fall under this category? The LAHD in the ordinance claims 333 hotels. We probably are addressing the concerns about 100 of those hotels. So of your following, about 100 would have concerns or had difficulty in working this out with the housing department? Yes. And in respect to what Ms. Guerrero said, yes, they are properly staffed now. Those phone lines are properly staffed now, but they weren't in 05 and 06 and 07. Well, you make adjustments. I mean, when you find out that you have difficulties, you shift staff, you make adjustments. I'm glad to hear that you've made the necessary adjustments. Now, is there anything that we could do, and I don't have a clue as to what it would be, 
to have a meeting with Mr. Patel. He is the, he does represent a hundred. I mean, can we, I don't know, I'm asking you, it's your job. If I may, if I may respond to that. Um, any concerns of constituents in, in regards to this residential hotel ordinance concerns the department as well. And we take those concerns seriously. Um, we have we have spoken with Mr. Patel, uh, who, who is the representative of, of this organization. Uh, Ms. Babazadi has spoken with him personally. I have spoken with him in the, in the conference call with him. The general ma I brought it to the general manager's attention that there is issues that they're raising that we should at least listen to. Uh, she met with them. Um, she al they also met with the chief of staff uh, for Councilwoman Perry's office. And I also believe they also met with the deputy mayor uh, to address their concerns. And at the time that they raised the concerns to us, there were two. One was confidentiality, and which we, we believe we addressed, and of documents. And then two, the second one was the uh, issue of language barrier, which we considered to be a serious one, and we addressed that as well. Um, the issues that they raise are within the context of the ordinance. The, the, the flow chart, if you will, that Ms. Babazadi just explained to you, it's all laid out in the ordinance. We have gone through that process of, of vetting the ordinance and its, and its procedure. Um, I believe today is a different agenda item. I, I, we were not sure what was going to be discussed today uh, in terms of this issue, but the agenda item was to discuss the, the fee for the unit determination. Um, but we felt important enough that since we since they raise these issues, to, to, to listen to them once again, but they're the same issues that I believe have been addressed previously. Okay. You know, this is one of those you darned if you do, darned if you don't type of a thing, and I don't know, Mr. Pell, Mr. Patel, if we'll be able to accommodate you. It would appear to me that the department has tried to make adjustments uh, to be as fair as they can where it relates to this um, issue. And I would suggest that you continue to work with them and uh, uh, continue to outreach to your members to make sure that they understand how the process is set up and, and, and the various things that they, they have to do. I, I cannot think uh, of, of anything additional to suggest other than um, more outreach also to your members and to try to create a working relationship with the housing department staff and I would ask for you to continue and maybe even kick it up a notch to to work with uh, Mr. Patel. Uh, some of his concerns or their concerns seem uh, legitimate to me so I would hope <coughs> somehow we can work together and, and make this somewhat better. Uh, Chairman Weston, if I may add, I just want to explain what happens when you become a residential hotel when you're not a residential hotel. We'll use a 24-unit motel in the city of Los Angeles mm. example. Hold your point. It, let's say you made me think of something. Let's say uh, you determine that uh, Mr. Patel's uh, ho uh, hotel is a residential hotel. And how long does it keep that designation and what can he do to get, you know, off of the list? Or does it, once you give them that designation, are they that forever? The designation uh, keeps that hotel as a residential hotel. And uh, then just, uh, I believe there is one misunderstanding that I hear, is that they think uh, they cannot do anything and their operation is impacted by that. The only thing that this ordinance does is that regulates if they want to change uh, the uh, the status, uh, if they want to demolish or convert on these residential units. So within their property, they still can have transient units. Uh, no, I get that, but I'm curious about this designation thing. So again, like I own a, a, a hotel, you say it's residential, and I say that, uh, you know, not, it's, it's really not. I mean, I, I, what do I do? I mean, you've already given me that status. What do I have to do to prove that I should be in another category? Uh, there is a process on the ordinance uh, described that if they want to convert the property, the use of the property, they've got to come to the housing department and go through that conversion process. 
to do that. And in the event that they do that, they're taken, they're not given that status, that status is taken away from them, residential. After conversion. Okay. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Listen, I believe it's 55 years you have that status as residential hotels in the ordinance. And the conversion she's referring to is you have to either build an equivalent establishment down the road in the vicinity or put into the housing trust fund 80 percent of the value of each unit that they designate as residential, plus pay 100 percent of the land value. These are smaller hotels. These are our dreams in Los Angeles as we've come. Most of them are immigrant owned by the South Asian or Chinese community, Taiwanese community. And when they're tourist hotels, and LHD is determined through their process that it's actually a residential hotel, there is no training on the staff's part to determine that other than documentation. In our industry across America, there's extended stay markets, and people do stay in town. They come to Los Angeles to work or to work in the offices, and then they check out. And when you become a residential hotel, you can no longer possibly pass this on to your kids, or when you want to retire, sell the establishment, because nobody in our industry would look at a residential hotel to purchase because of the status it now has. Also, to stay competitive, we're continuously remodeling these motels in Los Angeles to stay competitive with the mid-market chains or even the higher end, because with the Internet, we're able to market our products fairly easily and compete in some areas for tourism that may not want to spend $200 at the Hilton, but will spend gladly $65 or $75 at a smaller lodging establishment that's kind of semi-boutique or just, you know, a lot cheaper to stay in while they're visiting or in the neighborhood they're just uh, overcrowding and they got family coming in and they want to stay at an uh, economically feasible establishment. These establishments, in order for them to pull building permits to put new tubs in or showers as, as remodelings take place, you pull a permit and you pay for the building and safety permit, then you have to pay the housing department a permit fee also. And I believe it's $2,000 per permit or something like that. They may be able to correct me, but I did remember seeing $2,000 in it. So just the operational part becomes difficult. But why we are here mainly is, is to express to you that there needs to be some intervention in this process. We are hotelers. LAHD is a housing uh, department. They are claiming through their training that these are housing establishments. And they're not. Many of them are not. I understand downtown area hotels, the 400, 500, uh, you did hotels that but are being establishments, the residential I, I hear you, but it would appear to me that the department has uh, afforded you an opportunity to make your case. And in the event that you are able to do that, then you would not. Right. And Chairman West and I applaud them for that. But what I'm trying to explain is many of our members have been converted from tourists to residential properties that are not residential. It's just they don't have the means to articulate to them. The tools that they're providing, if we don't want to send in registration cards, is yes, a spreadsheet where you data entry 30,000, 50,000, 60,000 registration card information. Now, what business in Los Angeles is, is, is that, burdened with that? That seems a bit much. Yes, sir. I mean, and then I just want to... No, what I'm saying is I, I don't... It, that number seems high. It is high. I mean, I, I, I wonder if, if you have that. I mean, there's certain things, I guess, that you're just going to have to do in order to uh, be, you know, change your status or rec be recognized as a non-residential uh, hotel. I mean, there are just certain things that I guess you're going to have to do. I, I, I don't. I don't think this committee would be empowered to to change anything. It would appear that there's a fair process in place, albeit a difficult one. It would appear to be very fair. If I had a magic wand, what would you want me to do? Chairman Weston, we want some equality in this ordinance. They haven't sent it to the mid-market hotels, which we represent, the Super 8s, the Best Westerns, and they haven't sent it to the Hiltons those surveys, or they haven't brought those properties in to send in their registration cards for evaluation. They're mainly targeting the independently owned Ma and Pa hotels in Los Angeles. The okay. question would be why. Okay. Respond to that if you would. I, I hear this reference about survey. I believe it's not accurate uh, what they are reading on the ordinance. Ordinance is making reference of what it was considered uh, at that time, 
they reviewed the billing history of these hotels, and they identified that these hotels are registering these units as residential, and they were not applying for exemptions, which is transient use exemptions. I believe that is the survey that was used, not the survey. We didn't send any survey to these hotels. That survey showed us that most of these property owners, they are accepting that they are residential. They are registering these units as residential units, and they are not applying to be exempted by having transient units. Just clarification for that survey. Okay. If I may. Yes. And let me be honest with you. I'm fascinated by this discussion. That's one of the reasons why we're just, you know, you're educating me. And we appreciate the opportunity to explain our process. We believe our process is fair. We believe our process affords due process, and we believe our process is transparent. Just a comment on this 55 years. The 55 years applies to you can be exempt from this ordinance if you have an affordable housing covenant for 55 years. But it's a two-step process. The process first is to determine the status, whether or not you are or not a residential hotel. The second part would be then to determine how many units in that hotel would be subject to the residential hotel ordinance. And that's the issue for here today. We're asking for a fee in order to make that determination. I got you. Once we make that determination, it does not necessarily mean that if you have a 50-unit hotel, that all 50 would be subject to the ordinance. And based on our determination count, it would play itself out in that fashion. Just that clarification. Okay. Excuse me if I may add one more thing, Commissioner Wesson. How come more does I, Housing Department? I just want to clarify one of the comments that was made earlier was that certain hotels were being targeted. It would appear, since I'm the Department's hearing officer, and I am the one who provides the ultimate due process hearing to anyone who wants to appeal a Department's determination. And I can assure you that in that context, when I look at the evidence that's presented from both sides and make sure that the law is applied as the way that it was meant to be. And the Department doesn't walk in necessarily just having a presumption that they're correct. They actually go through and investigate every point that they make in addition to vetting every single piece of evidence that's delivered to me that would refute the Department's determination. But the hotels that receive the initial inquiry as to whether they're residential hotels or not, that has to do with both the physical dimensions of the hotels in terms of the number of guest rooms that they have and additional factors that come into play. For example, as Director Babazade earlier mentioned, these hotels paid fees when they received the annual bills from the RSO and from the SCEP annual fees, and they paid them as residential units, and they did not necessarily apply for an exempt status. I have reviewed cases that have come before me where that was the case, but I have still overturned the Department's determination because that specific hotel owner was able to provide evidence that showed that notwithstanding the fact that at the time in 2005, 2006, they had paid those fees and they hadn't asked for an exemption, the records that they had showed that the majority of the units in that property were occupied by transient units. So that gives you just I wanted to provide you a little additional detail and flavor of exactly how this process works and that it's not selective for that the reason that specific properties receive this notice from the Department has to do with steps that they have made or their failure to apply for exemption back in the time that the ordinance was adopted. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I want to thank all of you for providing me with the education today. No, we don't. I'm dealing only with these people. There's no give and take with the audience. So anyway, Mr. Patel, I think you should continue to have a dialogue with the representatives of the Housing Department. And I think we're going to take a brief recess and then we'll come back for the last case. Thank you.
Uh, I would hope that the Housing Department would keep me apprised as to what's going on. Uh, again, thank everybody for coming down, and I will recommend as uh, Mr. Garcetti. No, go right, right ahead. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think part of the issue here is that we're attempting to find something that hasn't been defined in the past. Is that right? And, we're, and maybe the city attorney, if I could ask you to come forward. Mr. Pell, if, if you don't mind just switching out, thank you. Um, I mean, essentially, uh, this was designed to, to protect hotels that were being converted um, that were a very important part of our very low-income housing stock. And I know that's different than a lot of the hotels that um, and motels have been defined, but it, it, we're essentially trying to define something that, that we as a city have never defined as a, as a formal category. Correct, and the, the definition comes from state law because okay. um, in essence you're precluding owners of residential rental establishments from, um, from going out of business essentially for no cause and without restriction. Ordinarily that would violate the Ellis Act, but the Ellis Act provides for an exemption, exception from the Ellis Act of residential hotels um, in cities of a, with a population of a million or more or city and county. So if you're a residential hotel in San Francisco, LA or San Diego, we can lawfully regulate the use and, and put conditions upon their um, going out of business. And so the, the definition of residential hotel comes from state law because that's the exemption from the Ellis Act. And, and there's no state or local um, definition um, or of three categories of residential, extended stay, and transient. No, I, I believe it refers to um, buildings of six units or more that are primarily residential. And there's no, there's even no definition of primarily, but I believe most use the, would use the term majority. So that, that would be the standard that, that was adopted. And state law, does it give detail about what residential is? Or if we kind of provided that detail in our definition? In the no, ordinance? I don't believe it does give um, a definition as to what is meant by residential. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Hold on one sec. So, so, I mean, the, the, and it's not necessarily everything that's been said here, but it, it does, um, maybe on the housing department and city attorney, it would bear some investigation to look at. I mean, we know that the intention of this was never to necessarily capture extended stay hotels that, that kind of function but don't necessarily function as apartments, the SROs and, and other things that we have downtown. And it's not even necessarily what folks have brought up here, but it did capture my attention that that, that is a, a third category in some ways that um, could be um, unwillingly kind of brought in. And, and Council Member, it, my first reaction to that is certainly that's something we'd look into, but what you're <coughs> describing, I believe, would be a policy judgment, not a legal judgment, because the city is not required to regulate these these buildings, so that if you wanted to um, pull back the regulation and exempt a certain category of hotels, I believe that would be a policy decision and would be lawful, so long as it's right. rational. Yeah, the, the difficulty would be defining it. And, I mean, that because so an extended stay hotel may have no, um, no definable characteristic different than the downtown ones, which is which gets back to the physical investigation. I mean, I think we all know residential, I mean, extended stay hotels when we see them versus kind of an SRO downtown. Councilmember Garcetti. If we're not seeing it, then we don't know that. Uh, if I may, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sorry, but I just wanted to um, contribute to the, you acquired the answer to your question. The state definition, which is incorporated into the residential hotel ordinance, specifically says that if it's the primary residence of those guests, so in, an, in, in what we uh, typically conceive of as an extended stay hotel, if I'm staying in, in an extended stay hotel for over 30 days, I have another place where I live, which is my primary residence. Uh, and so evidence that the guests who are staying there have another uh, place, which is their primary residence, is evidence that is, uh, that is um, looked at and considered in making the determination and certainly is evidence that I have considered in making my determination. It's an argument that has prevailed in, in a specific case because evidence was provided to me that those guests, while they stayed there for over 30 days, they had other places which they um, lived at and this was just for work purposes. So it's not, it's not the case that it's not necessarily addressed within the context of the ordinance itself because it, it's not just that it's primary residential, right. meaning that it's 30 days or more, 
But it's also that it's the primary residence of those guests or the opposite. If it's a transient, primarily transient, and it's not the primary residence of those transient guests either. So the housing department has been making that distinction. Absolutely. And it is your policy to make that distinction, that if there's evidence that can be provided that shows that these tenants have primary residences elsewhere, that this will not be defined as captured under the. If the argument is made and the evidence is provided to me, I will definitely take that into consideration in making the final determination. Before the appeal, is that also being, is that also a lens that you are refracting things through as well? They brought to our attention that there are special businesses, conferences that people come and stay for a longer period of time. They provide that documentation and we take into consideration for identifying if it's primary residence. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Garcetti. No, 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 no. This is what I'm going to do. Because this could go on forever. And I'm not going to let it go on forever. What I am going to ask the housing department to do is to set up another meeting with you, with the city attorney, and try to answer various concerns that you have. I personally am satisfied at the responses that I have received from the department. I do think that there might be some communication misconnections between them and you or misunderstand. So that's what I hope that you guys can work out. But with that said, Mr. City Attorney, and I would appreciate if you would keep my staff apprised after you do have, and I will put it upon you to try to set up this meeting with Mr. Patel. Absolutely, Counselor. And just keep me through Andrew apprised as to what's going on. So, Mr. City Attorney, as a communique from the chair, we will adopt the city attorney's report and draft ordinance. Ms. Barclay, is there any more business before this committee? No, sir. Then this committee is adjourned.